Hi, everyone. Dr. Tim and Hillary for another Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast. How are you doing this morning, Hillary? I'm doing okay. How about you? I am ready to rumble. All right. I got to ask before we get started, you just were at Aquashella last weekend? Mm -hmm. Has it already been a week? How was that? Was it fun? It was fun. Yeah. Aquashella is... It's a totally different show than Reef of Palooza. Reef of Palooza is a great show, especially, but it's corals, mostly corals and corals and frags, stuff like that, which is great. Aquashella is a menagerie, <laughs> a big menagerie. I mean, you you had a great uh, planted uh, tank contest, freshwater, freshwater shrimp, uh, the parrot head. Those are... Is that what they are? I'm not talking Jimmy Buffett fans. <laughs> I was thinking Jimmy Buffett, but you're probably yeah, talking uh, cichlids. Paired, yeah, parrot cichlids. Uh, not my not my thing. Um, and of course, corals and frags. But you've got some nice stores there, and and a lot of Saturday crazy. A lot of people. Sunday was busy too. It's it's just a very diverse show, and a lot of novice, a lot of people uh, walking around with their dogs and actually two people carrying their cats i am not kidding oh wow i wouldn't have expected that no i wouldn't have either were uh, there any lizards no oh, snakes and lizards yep and uh, then of course uh as i was sending you pufferfish fifteen hundred dollars yes folks oh. one thousand four hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents for a pufferfish but it was a cute puffer fish. Wow, well, now we're buying cuteness, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, we would ever, yeah, whatever you say, Hillary. No, I, I didn't say I was going to spend that. I just said it's a very cute puffer well, fish. I was waiting for you to give me your credit card number. I bought you two and brought them home. Um, what was this? This was a uh, a cross river puffer. That's right. I have no idea what that means. It, it's crazy. So when I first started out in the aquarium hobby, I started out on the freshwater side and it was puffer fish that really got me into it. And there really wasn't a lot of variety. Like I can remember rarely seeing um, the South American puffers, which is the one I had, but usually pea puffers and figure eights were all that you saw. And now there's so many different species that you find on the market. It's kind of cool. Well, if you're interested in puffers, that was the place to be. There were a lot. Uh, some marijuanas people were selling. There was a great variety of freshwater fish, saltwater fish. Um, just pretty cool. Yep. Was this a show that one year had a an owl? Um, yes. And one year when it was in Chicago, had a kangaroo. Oh, that's cool. You just never know what you're going to see. So, folks... Put your scuba gear on. We're jumping down the rabbit hole full of water a little bit here today. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. Today, because because I read this and I read it and I keep on reading this on these forums. And it drives me a little crazy. Okay. It drives me pretty crazy. And the what, because I haven't even told Hillary what we're going to talk about. She said, well, I said it was going to be a surprise. And she said, great. She likes surprises. Anyways, you read it all the time in the forums. Uh, you know, in this, uh, don't worry about nitrite in your saltwater tank. It doesn't affect anything. So when you're cycling your system, don't even bother measuring nitrite. Don't worry about it. You know, nothing to see here, folks. That's wrong. Okay. I'm going to say it two more times. It's wrong. Plain and simple. It's wrong. Now, why is that? Well, because people take a little bit of what they know or what they read, and they expand it to mean everything. And what I'm talking about is it is true that if you're talking about acute fish toxicity, nitrite is much more toxic in fresh water than in salt water. So people then expand that. Well, since you don't have to worry about nitrite quickly killing fish because acute toxicity means that it's going to kill things in a short period of time. It's acute versus chronic. Chronic toxicity is that 
the chemical or whatever the toxin you're talking about slowly kills the target organism uh what could be weeks months years by basically poisoning them or loss of appetite or just a slow progression which takes a long period of time acute toxicity means that the organism dies in a fast fashion now what's fast it all depends you've got you know 24 hour LC50s. I used to, a long time ago, work on, in my master's thesis was on acute toxicity of ammonia in fish. And, and you, they have these terms, LC50, which means lethal concentration to 50% of the population in the test vessel. And then they'll have a 24 hour, 96 hour, you know, 120 hour, some type of time period. And with this type of testing, it's used to establish uh, some, some relatively safe limits. But there's a procedure here. And what you do is, is you put so many animals in the aquarium, and then you dose, in this case, ammonia, and you measure ammonia over the test period, 24 hours, 48 hours, 96 hours. And measure how many animals die and at what you know what time they die and then there's some computer programs now that you plug in and it comes up with a number so you've got what the ammonia concentration was you're trying to hold it steady if you know you have tanks because you want to do this all at the same time this is another we're, we're not going to get into pseudo replication but you'll have a tanks with no ammonia and then maybe 0.25 Point five, you know, one, two, five, ten. Um, you have to know the salinity. You have to know the pH because the toxic form of ammonia is ammonia and H three, and in water, uh, at the pHs that we keep fish, not a hundred percent of the total ammonia is in the NH3 form. You've got so much, usually a uh, vast majority of it is in the NH4 plus the ammonium form, which is not toxic. Anyways, you've, you do all, all this and you uh, have an I you know what the, um, the ammonia NH3 concentration is by plugging in the pH and the salinity and the temperature. You want to try to keep it steady during the duration of the test. And then it comes up with that the LC50 um, is, you know, 1.2 or 3.4, whatever it is. Uh, and that is used by government agencies and others to, to then calculate what a temporary safe level is, which is usually 10% of the LC50, and a longer period would be 100% uh, of one hundredth of the LC50 is some, sometimes used as a safe concentration. So anyway, what I'm trying to get to is there's procedures here. So if you look at the LC50 of uh, freshwater fish versus saltwater fish, you're going to find that in freshwater the nitrite concentration, the acute number is is low. Five, you know, depend. It depends on several things. It depends on the species. Like rainbow trout are very susceptible to ammonia nitrite poisoning, uh, whereas a channel catfish can tolerate at least ten to twenty, thirty times more ammonia or nitrite than say a rainbow uh, trout. That sounds about right. Uh, yeah, and catfish and then are indestructible. Pretty much. And then now you, you look and you see what they do these tests in salt water. And sometimes they'll do the test with an anadromous fish, like a striped bass, which is what I worked on, because it can be both freshwater and salt water. So you can take the same fish, same progeny of, uh, of a fish and expose it to, a ver you can add salinity in there. So, you know, it's, it's, basically siblings and you've got some in fresh water some in salt water and you're exposing them to this anyway what you'll find is that 
the LC50 can be, you know, instead of in the low numbers, you know, one to 10, it can be 150, 200 or more. And that's because in salt water, the chloride ion provides a, uh, a safety, it provides protection against the nitrite toxicity. And nitrite kills fish by what's called brown gill disease. The nitrite inhibits the ability of the blood to bind oxygen. And so instead of having nice red gills, the fish have brown gills because there's no oxygen in the blood and basically they starve to death. Told you this was a rabbit hole, folks. Anyways, fair warning. So, so let's get back on topic here. So people look and they go, oh, well, uh, you know, nobody's going to have nitrite in their saltwater tank of 100 or 200 or even 50 milligrams per liter. So nothing to hear, nothing to see here, uh, folks. Don't worry about nitrite. Don't even measure it. Well, that's great if we're talking about fish, but what else is in your aquarium, especially when you're cycling. I know everybody raised their hand and said bacteria. <laughs> Come on, you had, I know, I just know that. You, you said bacteria. Yes. Of course. And what type? The nitrifying bacteria. Those are the ones that we're trying to do. We're trying to start up the system. And people do, you know, because I've um, pontificated got on the soapbox and preached about this, is that when you're cycling, you want to keep your nitrite low. And others will say that I don't know what I'm talking about. And um, it's kind of a bunch of horse pucky what I'm saying. Well, that's because they're taking what I'm saying and they're applying it to fish. And I'm talking about cycling your aquarium. I'm talking about things in a, in a different mode. And so what are we talking about? We're talking about bacteria. And there are studies on this. And there was a great study by a, a, a person called Lisa Stein. She did her uh, PhD she did it at Oregon State. And she's a professor uh, now at her own lab. And what she looked at was, and here's the title of this paper that she did. And it was loss of ammonia monooxygenase activity in nitrous ammonis europea upon exposure to nitrite. Okay, now what the heck, Tim, did you just say? Okay, so loss of ammonia monooxygenase. Anything word that ends in science with an ASC means there's an enzyme involved. And when you convert ammonia to nitrite, it's a two-step process. Yes, the ammonia to nitrite, there's actually two steps in there. And those steps are helped along by an enzyme called the ammonia monooxygenase enzyme. So what she's looking at is loss of that enzyme activity in ammonia oxidizing bacteria upon exposure to nitrite, which is basically, she wanted to study the higher the nitrite in the water did the bacteria lose the ability or did or, or did the ability of the bacteria to convert uh, ammonia to nitrite slow in the presence of high nitrites? And the answer is yes. And what, you know, we'll get to the conclusions. I'm not going to read the whole paper. But basically... What she showed was that nitrite can cause a specific loss of ammonia oxidizing activity in, you know, nitrous ammonia europea cells at concentrations much lower than what previously considered. And so this is what I'm talking about is that you have to consider that, especially when you're setting up a fish tank or your aquarium, you're trying to get these night these ammonia and nitrite oxidizing organisms to get established you need the bacteria and what happens when you're cycling tanks and what do we talk about we say keep your ammonia and nitrite below five milligrams per liter and we're not doing that just to do it we're we're trying to get you cycled 
and use science to get you cycled faster. And this talk is me telling you why we're trying, we want you to keep it low because the higher you go with the nitrite, it sets back everything. And I'm not going to quote paper after paper um, on this. I will give one more example in a, in a minute. But what others have shown is that the higher the nitrite, you also lose nitrite oxidizing bacteria ability. Nitrite is very toxic to organisms, not, not just fish. And when you set up a new tank, what are you trying to do? Establish the bacteria. So what you want to do is ignore all these people that are telling you to, don't, to not worry about nitrite, and there's no such thing as a nitrite um, stall. There is. Science has shown that there is. And why do people get nitrite? Uh, or why do, why do there, that will not, you know why you get nitrite, the ammonia is oxidized, the nitrite. Why do you get the stall? So, and I talked to a lot of people at uh, Aquashell about this last week, and Hillary, what do people do? They're adding ammonia and they're getting a tank cycled. The ammonia oxidizing bacteria work faster than the nitrite oxidizing bacteria. So these bacteria get their energy from the conversion or oxidation of ammonia to nitrite or nitrite to nitrate. That conversion yields some energy. It yields very little energy compared to like the heterotrophs that use sugars, uh, you know, organic substances to get energy. So the cells grow slower because they're producing less energy because the energy yield of converting ammonia and H3 to NO2 minus doesn't yield a lot of energy. What happens, though, is that the ammonia oxidizers can grow faster. They can double in as little as, you know, under the best situations, 10 to 15 hours. Whereas the nitrite oxidizers, their doubling rate is 24 to 30 hours. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if you start doing the math, it is significant. And what happens in the aquarium? You're, you're adding ammonia. The ammonia is disappearing relatively quickly, even when you use the Dr. Tim's one and only. Yes, it, you know, it, the ammonia disappears quickly. But the ammonia is converted to nitrite, and now the nitrite's building up because the nitrite oxidizing bacteria take longer to convert to nitrite to nitrate. But people have got their test kits and they see there's no ammonia. There hasn't been any ammonia for a couple of days. My bacteria are starving. I've got to add more ammonia. And this is the number one issue with cycling is that the hobbyist thinks the ammonia oxidizing bacteria are starving to death and have to be fed ammonia every day or some people every, you know, a couple of times a day because it's not there, they've, they've eaten it all. And if they don't get more, they're going to starve. And that is 100% wrong. But people keep on adding ammonia. I mean, we've had people buy an eight ounce bottle of ammonia to cycle a 20 gallon, 30 gallon tank. Eight ounces is for 400 gallons. Okay? Because, and when you keep on adding that ammonia and it converts, it converts it to nitrite and the nitrite builds up and builds up and builds up. And eventually two things, well, one thing's already happened. The nitrite's building up. The nitrite bacteria are basically being poisoned. They're working slower. They're not, be, not being killed. They're just working slower because of the high nitrite in the water. But then ammonia will come back. People say, well, my tank was cycled. Why do I, you know, why am I seeing low levels of ammonia because the nitrite's gotten so high, it has inhibited the ability of the ammonia oxidizing bacteria to oxidize 
the ammonia. So this is why I and talk about this a lot, why we put it on our website, why we have it you know, in all our guides, is resist the urge to continually add ammonia to the tank and not measure or, or just let the nitrite get higher and higher. Your cycle will stall. So uh, what you need to do is not add ammonia every day. Pay attention you know the nitrite bacteria are going to work slower. So don't feed the system. The bacteria are not going to starve. They can go a long time without ammonia. So going, going a few days and letting the nitrite oxidizing bacteria catch up, uh, they, they can live. I'll pause here, Hillary, because I feel like I haven't even taken a breath. Any questions? <laughs> Actually, I do have a question. So when you are cycling your tank, you should be doing testing. Would you say that there's a set, say, like you should test the tank every night at 8 p.m. or you should test the tank after you, like so many hours after you add something? Do you think that's an important thing to do or does it really matter? Well, it, it does. It does. You should measure... Uh, if, you know, at the same time each day, assuming that you added ammonia at the same time each day. So what I would say is add, you know, if you're working, going to school, you know, you're not going to be able to sit in front of your tank. Add the ammonia in the morning, go about your, you know, your day and come back and be, you know, 12 hours later, um, measure. So add it in the morning, come back, and then 12 hours later in the early evening, late, whenever that is, um, measure your uh, ammonia and nitrite. Don't worry about nitrite. Two reasons. If you have nitrite in your system, it will in, uh, interfere with the nitrate test kit. So you're going to get a wrong number. And secondly, very few to none of the nitrate test kits out there measure low levels of nitrate accurately. So you're gonna see zero and think things aren't happening, but until the nitrate gets to be 15 or 20 milligrams per liter, these test kits don't work. Unless you're willing to shake the, the first part for, for a long time, because the third part is nitrate test kits actually measure nitrite. That first chemical that you add basically converts the nitrate to nitrite, and then you do, you're do you doing a nitrite test. So to get an accurate number, you actually have to measure nitrite and nitrate on the samples, the, you know, the, the same sample, and then subtract the nitrite value from the nitrate value. Was that clear, Hillary? Yeah, I was going to actually add to that. If you want more in-depth stuff, we did a whole podcast on this topic. It's been a it's been a while, but been there's a while. definitely yeah. a top a podcast about it. Right. You know, in, in the lab, it's it's old school. You run your water through a cadmium reduction column, and what that's doing is it's reducing the nitrate to nitrite, it's taken out of oxygen. So it's taken in NO3 minus to NO2 minus. But you've got to measure nitrite at the same time and you subtract whatever your nitrite value is from the nitrate and that gives you your actual nitrate concentration. It just doesn't matter. You're wasting your time and your money measuring nitrate in a newly set up tank. Measure ammonia, measure nitrite, try to measure... Um, at least the same lapse from when you added the ammonia. You know, and don't and don't add, don't measure 15, 20, 30 minutes. The bacteria aren't that fast. This is hours. So minimum eight, tw 20, uh, 12 hours, 24 hours, something like that. But it's really important to measure these in the beginning when you're doing a fishless cycling to know where to go. And if you're, you know, we had that, I think, in the last question and answers is, I'm in a hurry. I'm in a hurry. We we don't like people being in a hurry. It's it's not a good place to be in the fish hobby. But 
if you are trying to cycle as fast as possible, you really need to have test kits, ammonia, nitrite, if you're using fresh water, pH and alkalinity is important to measure. In salt water, not so much because you're using salt, which will increase the pH and increase the alkalinity. So there's, there's one reason why you want to uh, ignore the people that tell you don't worry about um, nitrite when you are uh, cycling your saltwater aquarium. You do. So far, so good, yep. Hillary? Yep. So now, uh, okay, you've cy you're cycling and, okay, you're worried about the bacteria, things like that. Well, there's other issues with nitrite. As I said, nitrite is a well-documented uh, toxico toxicological agent. I wonder if that was correct English. It's, it's poison. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And it actually can uh, uh, appear in a couple of different forms like nitric acid and others. And it can have a negative effect on the physiological aspects and physiological functions of animals in your aquarium. And we're not just talking about bacteria, but we're talking, you know, we've got fish, you've got invertebrates, you've got corals and things like that. And so while nitrite can be tolerated to a much higher uh, number in saltwater aquariums and saltwater fish, you got to think about what else is in there and about transportation of oxygen and things like that. And so this gets to what's called the chronic, the low level. So you have this high nitrite and you're paying attention to every, you know, all the experts on the web and yet your fish isn't dead. Okay. So it's not acutely toxic, but what's happening is your fish is being stressed because the nitrite is affecting cell blood oxygen levels. It's affecting all these other physiological functions that basically are stressing the fish. And people when I had that um, at, at the show. This guy said, you know, I, I added a fish to my tank and it wiped everything out. And I said, yeah, you know, it's, I really feel sorry for you. You know, and that's a good reason to quarantine. He goes, I was quarantining. Well, what was it? Well, you know, it was a new tank and um, I had added some fish and everything was fine. And then I had this other fish coming out of quarantine. You know, the nitrite was high, but really didn't have to worry about that. You know, and I, I put it in there. And then, you know, a little while later, a couple of days later, everything started to go south on him. And that's because nitrite can uh, affect respiration. It can affect the ion processes, you, you, the ion regulatory processes in fish. It can affect the endocrine system in fish. It can affect the cardiovascular system in fish. And these are these chronic things. It's kind of like, you know, doctors will tell you, you don't smoke. Why? Well, smoking isn't going to kill you today. It's not going to kill you tomorrow. But a history of smoking every day, several, you know, cigarettes, packs of cigarettes, day in and day out, what happens? You know, it takes different amounts of time on people, but 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the line, now you've got respiratory problems. You can't breathe, basically. Uh, you, you've seen the pictures and things like that. That's chronic. And it just happens to happen faster in aquariums, uh, to, you know, in and especially during cycling, is that the fish are already stressed, and you're putting them into an environment where their the water chemistry is going to stress them even more. And there was another cool PhD dissertation by a guy named John Colt, and he looked at the growth of channel catfish fry or fingerlings with. Subtoxic, subacute toxic, meaning 
chronic ammonia levels. So he had these tanks where he fed a constant water source, and then that water source had a constant a level of ammonia. And he did this with different amounts, you know, different levels of ammonia in the system. And the pictures are amazing. You can see, you know, that the, the fish with a low level of ammonia was like a quarter of the size after so many days than the fish that were in aquariums where there was no ammonia in the aquarium ever. It was just flushed out so much there was no aquarium. Wow. So the, yeah. And and so this is what I'm trying to, to get and hammer today, I guess, is um, toxicity comes in many forms. And when you're just talking about, well, my fish is alive or dead. Okay, that's the acute... And yes, your nitrite in your saltwater tank isn't going to kill your fish in 24 hours. But it's stress, it's inhibiting your bacteria, and it's adding needless stress to your fish, which are already stressed and can be a cause of, you know, when you're when they're stressed, when you're stressed, you're more susceptible to diseases. So ignore all this advice. Um, about, you know, don't worry about high nitrite in your saltwater aquarium. It's it's benign. It's not true. Is that clear enough, Hillary? It is. <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy. I think over the past several years, especially when I was working at the aquarium, we used to take care of the uh, big fish in the Bass Pro Tanks. And they were under so much more stress. Like it was really hard to get to do water changes, but there was a lot of them in there. And there was people all the time up at the glass, like banging on the glass. You know, there's people throwing pennies into the tank, which also stresses them out. And it wasn't until like you would see those fish. You're like, oh, wow. Like you, it really made you aware of what a big issue stress is. And how many problems it can cause. And it's not instantaneous. It happens over time. Exactly. And and the issue is, is because we, my people say, well, you know, if it's stress and happens over time, it's it's a year, two years down the line. Well, it's not in a, your newly set up aquarium, which is where you're going to see high nitrite, because the fish have just come in. And, and while everyone preaches quarantine, let's get back to reality. A lot of people don't have the resources, time, space, money to quarantine their fish. It's what you should do, but we don't always do what we should. Um, and even if you <laughs> have, am I wrong on that? No, it's the, probably very, very true. Yeah, I, that applies to um, more than just aquariums. But there's a lot of stress agents in setting up a new aquarium. The water, you know, we say this, your fish prefer older water rather than newer water. Now, why is that? Well, because maybe the bacteria aren't doing as well because they need a little phosphate or something in the water. Um, and the, maybe the the water has residuals from other things. We, we don't know the answer to that. But high nitrite can definitely stress more than just fish. Um, any, any, basically stresses all organisms and the fit and they're already under stress of being moved adjusting to light we see that with corals you know people just have these bright the brand new 800 dollar lights i'm turning these suckers on and we're going full blast um that's a stress people are walking back and forth adjusting the filter like you said there's just so many things there you know think of you were in a glass box and people pounding on the walls, the lights on all the time, just no place where your system can relax. And these, you, you know, you can actually measure these in the blood chemistries. Um, and there's been some studies on that. Really? Yeah, yeah. You can. Oh, there's some stress agents or things that that are uh, analog. You know that oh. that you can measure. Um, I would love to do a study. Does that kill the fish if you take a sample? No, it this taking the sample doesn't kill the fish. It's generally what you got to do is anesthetize the fish because mm -hmm. it's the handling and things like that. Then you have to have a, a laboratory to, make, to measure the blood chemistries you're looking at. So that would be a really interesting study to do. Yeah, I can try to find those because I know um, there was a guy looking at uh, juvenile uh, 
striped bass and hybrid striped bass in this stress zone mode. Oh, it's been a while. But you can definitely measure things in there that that tell you the level of stress in the fish. So interesting. The other thing, because what nitrite definitely does chronically is affect the blood chemistries, and like I said, the ionic balance. And all those things are brand new in new aquariums. You've you've got um Sometimes and, and people are adding additives and doing all this stuff. So the chemistry is changing. And we as humans look at, you know, the bigger picture. Uh, and we don't think about, especially with bacteria, it's, you know, it's microbiology. Things are happening on small levels. And so changes that we might consider, oh, the calcium's only this. Well, how about the calcium magnesium ratio or how about the potassium levels there's so much that we don't know about how these things affect fish and corals and bacteria that we kind of assume they don't where i would caution to take the other approach assume that they do uh, and we don't we don't measure those people measure ammonia they measure nitrite and ph and looks good well, how do we know? Things, things, things are, you know, a lot of lot, let's face it, a lot of fish die during the setup period, you know, the the uh, first 30, 45 days. And um could we have prevented that uh, with a little better chemistry, a little better knowledge? And that's what we're trying to do here is uh provide the best environment for the bacteria and then the fish to get everyone through the startup period, get the tank established as I think we said a couple of weeks ago. There's that point, especially, I mean, it happens in all aquariums, but especially saltwater aquariums where you hit it and the aquarium is just gorgeous and on its own and you step back and you don't want to touch it. But to get there takes time. And um, it just kind of drives me crazy when people are saying, don't worry about nitrite, because it's one of those things that is definitely a toxicological agent over a lot of trophic levels, which means it kills things, whether they're bacteria, corals, or fish. I'll get out of the science mode there for a second. Would you say that phosphate levels, I know we're not talking about phosphate in this podcast, really, about but... Go ahead. Could high levels of phosphate be to a point where it's toxic? I mean, I know it's going to cause all sorts of issues with like algae and stuff, yeah. but well, the could bigger... it cause the same sort of harm as like high nitrates? Not that I know of, but what I do know is low levels of phosphate, as in no levels of phosphate, inhibit things. Every live organism needs phosphate especially bacteria. And what do, what do, what, what's a feature of sea salts? No, no ammonia, no nitrite or no nitrate, no phosphate. And so, but we're trying, we need the bacteria. And when we're growing nitrifiers, we add a small amount of phosphate because that is the, it's very necessary. Your, the DNA is, is got phosphates all over it. And a phosphate-free environment is kind of like a phosphate-free fish food. Nothing's going to live there. So I don't know that high levels are toxic, but I do know that low levels or no, you know, zero is basically inhibit cycling because you have to have some of these micronutrients um, for the for the bacteria to oxidize and grow. I'm trying to remember one of the presentations that I sat at during raw. Um, Charles Delbeck was talking about nitrogen and phosphorus and how they relate and issues that they had with the corals. And I wish I could remember, he had these really great slides. I wish I had them to reference for this conversation. There, there, and people are working on that is certain ratios. And, and we're not talking about the red field ratio. Everybody wants to throw that out there, but understand that the red field ratio 
only applies to algae. Red field ratio does not apply to bacteria and the red field ratio does not apply to corals. And now people are going, what is he talking about? Who's the red field guy? What's the red field ratio, the lighting or something? No. So there was this oceanographer. Uh, his last name was Red Field. And it's from, ooh, don't hold me to this, maybe the 30s or 40s, 1930, 1940. And um, what he found was that the ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus was pretty steady at I'm good to go out here on a limb folks this is don't don't i'm trying to remember marine biology from a long time ago it's like 16 carbons to 12 nitrogens to one phosphorus Anyways, 106 that could... to 16 to one. You're close. Ah, sure. Close. <laughs> 106. Well, if you put a zero in there, <laughs> you're, just in that you're zero, close I for a part close. of it. Yeah. I knew there was a one in there. Um, I got the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. But anyways, what he found is that that ratio held true, but we're talking about algae. And when that ratio varies, you you the system tends to grow or not grow different types of organisms and i don't know if that's what i because i didn't see charles talk um uh, if that's what he's talking about with corals is that i do believe that if the carbon if the carbon nitrogen phosphorus ratios get out of balance but they're different numbers for bacteria and corals um, you're not going to be able to grow those. They have to have so much. It's the same with calcium and magnesium. If you have too much of magnesium, but not enough calcium, uh, the, the corals can't calcify. So, because there's too much magnesium in the water. There's, there's a lot of chemistry we ignore because chemistry, you say that and it's hard. You know, I don't know what scares people most, more chemistry or microbiology. Oh, that's tricky. Physics? All, physics. Ah, physics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyways, I'm going to step off the soapbox for this podcast. And uh, just remember, um, don't believe everything you read on these forms. Uh, and change your water. I mean, and don't overfeed your bacteria ammonia. How's that? I think that's, that's a good note to end on. Um, next up, we've got, what shows do we have? Uh, Reefapalooza, New York. Which yeah. was held in New Jersey. I need oh, yeah. to call them that Reefapalooza <laughs> Tri-State. Okay. It's in the Meadowlands, much easier. You don't have to go across the bridge. You don't have to pay the tolls and stuff like that. It's always a fun show. So It is a fun show. Okay, everyone. Next time, we're probably back to questions and answers. Um, I've got yep. some other ideas, but I just wanted to talk about this because it was kind of, um, well, I know it's, it's a reason. High nitrite is definitely a reason why people have difficulty cycling. So keep the nitrite low. You can do that by water changes. And um, when you, you know, no, re no reason not to change water. If you've added the back, the one and only bacteria, that's fine. Do not siphon clean. Don't stir up your substrate. That's where the bacteria are. Don't change your filter pad. Just take some water from the upper water column, siphon that out into the bucket and then replace it. And water changes never hurt. They increase the alkalinity which then gets the pH back up. So the um, uh, ammonia is in the NH3 form and um, it dilutes the nitrite out of the system so the bacteria can uh, work faster. All right, everyone. This has been Dr. Tim and Hillary for another Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast. Good fish keeping.